Good morning to everyone. I am Maria Jesus Hernández Lerena from the University of La Rioja, and um, my paper is about the representations of black people in Canada from the perspective of utopian and dystopian discourses. The title of my paper is Utopian Dystopian Representations of Race in the Canadian Imaginary amendments performed by poetry and the visual arts. I will start with a question. How is Canada thought of by Canadians and non-Canadians in the popular imagination? What kind of peoples and events have been included in history to be remembered and which ones have been deleted? The beginnings of English Canada were defined in mainstream culture by the harsh stories of Europeans who wanted to explore or settle in extremely hostile northern lands. The loneliness and sense of exile permeate the writing of those who entered the literary histories first. Failed heroes such as Sir John Franklin in search of the Northwest Passage, and middle-class English women who found it hard to live far from civilization. In the visual imaginary collective, the stark, minimalist landscapes of the group of seven painters at the beginning of the 20th century, with their refiguring of all kinds of violent weather and solitary pine trees, added to the picture of the ordeals of the white man facing such a wilderness a tradition which runs parallel to that of milder romantic visions in a rural paradise of, for example, and of the Green Gables. As to the racial conflict in history, the displacement and erasure of the different groups of indigenous peoples has absorbed much deserved attention in history, media, and the arts, being a particularly sore point the cruelty of residential schools where First Nations children were separated from their families, secluded and victimized. However often the media, social agents, textbooks, and also the literature produced by non-white communities contest the idea of a pure and redeeming North and point to the cracks in their official multicultural policy, there still exists a commonplace assumption about the Canadian fair treatment of people of African and Caribbean origin, a treatment which appears to be opposed to that of their racist neighbor to the South, the USA. Canada was allegedly a land of refuge to the fugitive slaves from the United States at the time of the War of American Independence and the 1812 War. The Underground Railroad was an organization that helped black people escape to the then British North America. Thousands of black persons were taken to Nova Scotia with promises of freedom, and these and other arrivals created black communities with roots in the USA wars. What is perhaps little known is that these American slaves, black loyalists, did not find freedom in Canada. Slavery, the epitome of dystopia, was always a fact, as freedom was just theoretical, because black people did not equate their rights with whites. Laws were passed so that they could not set up businesses, for example, and well into the 20th century, they had to live in areas without roads, water, or sewerage, and their schools were segregated. Impoverished communities barely survive out of that time until the 60s and the 70s, such as Africville in Nova Scotia that uh, uh, you can see in the slide, or for example, Hogan's Alley in Vancouver. These were spaces of black people's presence that were neglected, demolished, and uh, replaced by highways, and uh, their people uh, were relocated. So besides this displacement that was the consequence of institutional racism and economic discrimination, uh, besides these particular examples, um, 
these communities were victims to another kind of violence, symbolic violence, as their lives were for a long time left, left out of history, the prioritized and their contribution to the country unacknowledged. So despite their deeply rooted histories in the country, they are still positioned as immigrants or newcomers. However, arts can come to the rescue and bring back to a, a bring back what has been pushed outside of the frame, so to speak. Images and words can test dream utopic spaces, the wilderness, the metaphors of Nordicity, the white settler rural small town imaginary, and take them to the nightmarish realm of apocalypse where they truly belong. The cultural work of producing Black Canadian presence out of its absence from the Canadian visual psyche can be seen in two exhibitions that were held in the Royal Ontario Museum. The first one was Into the Heart of Africa and the second one um, was entitled Here We Are Here, Black Canadian Contemporary Art. <clears throat> and these two exhibitions have African and Caribbean peoples represented from the outside and from the inside, so to speak. The first one, of which you're going to see its slide right now, provoked a series of violent protests among Black Canadians. And the second one, that I, I'll talk a little bit um, about that later on, the second one came about as a sort of corrective to the outrage of current limiting representations of the Blacks in Canada. So this Into the Heart of Africa was held in 1989 and displayed ethnographic artifacts from the colonialist period from a military and religious perspective. And although its intent was probably educational, sometimes ironical, the result was a reproduction of a colonial attitude towards exotic lands with primitive societies and the European duty to remedy their backwardness. People and objects on display embodied the colonialist eagerness for possession and population control. One of the most conspicuous images, for example, is this one of a British soldier that is piercing the heart of a Zulu warrior with his sword. A second slide there, you can see a photo of a, a white woman that is literally teaching black women a lesson on how to wash clothes. So. The selection of items uh, uh, showed the very motives, past and present, of the dictatorial impulse to possess, organize, classify, and monitor a group of subjects considered as lesser humans, machines that have to be trained to make profit and provide entertainment, and who are, at best, erasable minds, minds that have to be rewired. This is the same premise that generates dystopias, which on its other side are considered utopias for a dominant elite. So this exhibition then therefore reproduced this assumed goodness line in imperialism and disseminated by its first historians, the utopic desire of Western societies to create better societies in other lands where people could start from scratch an imposed fantasy that created an appallingly dystopic racialized world. This exhibition fueled violent reactions on the part of the black community and it was canceled there in Toronto in other museums in Canada and in the USA. Bearing this outrage in mind, um, the um, 2018 exhibition, Here We Are Here, a, a was put together in the same museum, this time with collaboration of the Black community. And a, here you can see a, a photo of a Sylvia Hamilton, whose, a, uh, whose a installation entitled here, 
uh, we are here it was the namesake of the whole exhibition. And what she did uh, in her installation was to weave her personal history in Atlantic Canada with the collective history of black people in the country. And so lists of a uh, with hundreds of names a uh, descent from the ceiling uh, these names were from enslaved black people and free loyalists and free refugees all these names that she had uh, gathered from the public archives of nova scotia and a uh, sylvia hamilton did with this uh, installation something that we're going to or i'm going to briefly discuss later on and that is to transform a legal documents um, into a, a different thing, just to bring to the foreground the kind of disguises that um, a legal discourses use in its a faithful a tyranny. Another preposition, this time by Chantal Gibson, it was called Altered Books, and a, a, about this, a, this a series of, of a, pieces, she she says, mm, if you took away the white space, what would the black text do? What would it say? A Chantal Gibson's proposition is made up of pieces that explore some mechanisms of oppression, myths, metaphors, and especially books. So this, a, this question refers a, to her meditation on the nature of books because she wants to explore new spaces in them and use the historical silences to defy the limitations of the book as such. Considered a fixed object, tied, bound, containing permanent and a um, and changing truths. So what she did is to pick up a series of popular books from the 19th and 20th century in Canada with titles such as Who's Who in Canada, Canada and its people, Romans of Empire, for example. And she takes the white away from them using black thread that is sewn into them until their margins are full of it and cause the book to become twisted. The book, therefore, a, becomes a strange object marked by black lines full of torsions. This material deforms the book and messes up what has been said before, points out what has been edited a, out and becomes a kind of symbolic performance, carried through this kind of visible and organic material that is thread that seems to grow and grow and interferes with our expectations. You can see another a, a picture of a, that a object there. So Chantal Gibson deconsecrates the book as a tidy and organized authority where black and white is given quite a different meaning from the well-known cliche. Um, Besides a, the sore sensations that are produced by our encountering, this is an, uh, excuse me, this is another photo of another of her uh, creations entitled Break the Book. And there you, you can read the kind of texts or the text that she altered. Um, I wanted to say that beside this a uh, kind of reference to our encountering a, a, with our own oblivion of past injustices, the exhibition does not only refer to the past. She also pursues to break master narratives by including contemporary definitions of what it means to be Black in Canada nowadays, showing how the legis legislated multiculturalism is a utopia that maintains the perception of Black people as other. And uh, that's why I have selected this fragment from an article by Kelsey Adam. Adams in her a review of a of a, the exhibition. Here we are here, and uh, she claimed to live in Canada as a black person is to live at the intersection of several anxieties. Subtle and overt racism pervades the black experience in this country but is frequently belittled as less abrasive than its southern counterpart. Meanwhile, we are overshadowed by that monolithic American idea of blackness. Black Canadian histories and cultural contributions are nearly absent within the national imaginary. 
and this volatile mixture of racism and erasure impacts our daily existence and influences our artistic practices." End of quotes. So um, uh, Michelle Pearson Clark's um, installation that you can see right now is entitled Suck Teeth and addresses these frustration in a frustrating emo emotions that Kelsey Adams talked about through a powerful sound and visual composition that shows the impotence felt by the little discriminations suffered every day. Second teeth is a gesture and a noise used by West African peoples that shows frustration, rage, disgust. It is a response to daily microaggressions. These sounds echo through the gallery, creating an irritating symphony of non-verbal language, a kind of chorus of disapproval that makes it impossible for the white Canadian to assume any comfort in the racist-free fantasy of not me, only them. This is another picture of that same installation that, as I say, is a, it has audio and sound and it can be found on the internet. On her part, a, using a different register, artist June Clark figures out her own growth into adulthood in the shape of a triptych, including photographs and poems. She uses the form of a triptych that is a piece of art made of three paintings that has religious connotations. And in them, what she does is to repurpose her family photos and add a poem that is um, made with a Dymo label maker as the ones that we used to do when we were a children. So what she does is each image represents a revelation in her life, the revelation of learning herself black, inferior and vulnerable. A, I will read out a, the what we can see here the poem that accompanies the photo. She says, the day that with the dictionary Valerie taught me the word nigger. So if anyone ever calls you that. In the second formative triptych, she writes, I always imagined that I never received anything as a child, but I do remember being disappointed that the chocolate Easter bunny was hollow. And then of course, there was the red broom and the dustpan set. And finally, I decided that I must become so famous and so recognizable so that they could never let me die in an emergency room. So we see that the simple lyrics that accompany these photographs are told by a little girl discovering the truths in her childhood adolescence and maturity. And these truths are first, that she's defined by others. Second, what she's to, supposed to do when she grows up. That is the reference to the broom and the dustman said. And third, how she can die, how she can die, excuse me, if she fails to be important. So the pronoun day in this poem is felt as a threat, as a, an anonymous group of people that are powerful enough to rule her life and give her destiny. So the quiet, the, the artist, excuse me, the artist quietly unearths this micro dystopias embedded in everyday things for a black person by remembering what other people have told her about her own life. I had another a, example of poetry a, a, by Marlene Rivers Phillips song. I will have just to go a, 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 through this a very, very briefly a, for lack of time. But at the, at the end of my paper, I'll be talking about two poets. The first one is Marlene a, Rivers Phillips and her poem Song, in which a, she a, meditates a, about a horrific event that happened at the end of the 18th century. In September 1781, a ship departed the west coast of Africa, heading to Jamaica with a cargo of 470 African slaves. Of them, 60 died of thirst, 
40 died by throwing themselves overboard and 150 were thrown overboard by the captain and his crew so that the ship owners could get the insurance. Um, after this uh, uh, incident, there was a trial in London, but since the black slaves were considered possessions, there was no murder accusation. The trial only revolved around the compensation for money. So uh, the documents of uh, some of the documents of our court of law that remain to this day, actually the legal decision, uh, Lern Nures Philip picks it up, rearranges these legal words and phrases in different layouts on the page, bombarding the reader with a purely nonsensical linguistic arrangements. And the poem, this poem as the, as the books did before, becomes strange looking, dismembered, a, a chaotic, it makes, the, it makes no sense. And the repetition of the laws, mandates, a, perhaps makes us, the reader, guess the agony of the drowning, of the forceful drowning of these people, and puts pressure on that legal text. Like many other texts, legal texts, many times refuse, refuse to make some humans accountable to other kind of humans. So, um, Nurves Philip clarifies about this. She said, I murdered the text, literally cut it into pieces, castrating verbs, suffocating adjectives, murdering nouns, throwing articles, prepositions, conjunctions overboard, jettisoning adverbs. I separate subject from verb, but from object and create semantic mayhem. So uh, she creates a, um, a, a, a text uh, that she has also performed publicly, uh, making time and space for those lost lives, whose um, whose a, a insistent litany disassembles the assertions of legal, political, and military narratives in which some lives matter and uh, some don't, because after all, dystopia is equals with extreme precarity and vulnerability. A very briefly, I'll just make a reference to another poem by Afua Cooper entitled Confessions of a Woman Who Burned Down a Town. And what she did is to a rescue the story of Mary Joseph Angelique, who was a black slave woman that was hanged in Montreal in 1734 because she was accused of burning part of that town in an attempt to escape from slavery. And the last days a, of the life of this woman in prison a, inspire the words of Afua Cooper, which she articulates in the simple but um, intense voice of a woman servant. Because this woman, in spite of the turmoil of her life in spite of the fact that uh, she lost her three children and no one paid attention to her plight, has this kind of libertarian impulses uh, inside herself. She has a passion to destroy and to release herself. And that's a piece of art, a mixed media, that shows a, a, a Mary Joseph Angelique and Montreal a, in the background. So I had selected a part of a poem by her, but I'm not going to read it out here to you just because I want just to stick to, to the time. So um, the possibility of, a, of imagining a utopia lies at the, very her, at, the, at the very heart of any dystopia, such as this one, a poignant dream that in many cases is only attainable after a free life, as when Angelique says that soon she will be free from the prison of this island and I will fly and fly and fly, as you can read at the end of her poem. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, going into uh, my conclusion, I would say that the semantic connotations involved in the notions of utopia and dystopia expand the ways in which we can think of colonialism as they share their modus operandi. That is, they are a battleground in which forces of threat and resistance are unleashed. Colonialism, like any dystopia, 
is a practice of linguistic and technological domination over a mass of citizens that seek control, that seeks control over minds and bodies, creating a massive underclass and punishing nonconformity. In this sense, to think of black oppression with the aid of a dystopic lens brings an awareness about apocalypse not being just future, because these colonial dystopias happen over and over again in our present. People in the first world often being passive spectators of the distant and close suffering of others. Thus, dystopias, as we all know, need not just need not be just a warning or projected into the future. They are past, present, and future, only that they are buried below layers of less disturbing discourses in mainstream cultures. The authors mentioned in this paper fight to regain the symbolic power that allows racialized individuals to gain authority in order to speak in the name of their collectivity. They defy prevailing visions of the social world and its divisions by literally, almost physically, attacking previous images, pages, texts, by amending dictionaries, histories, and the law, er eroding one way totalitarian linguistic practices that hold black people in the permanent prison of their skin and status. And there you can see a, some of the references of the bibliography that I have used to a, a write this paper. And a, thank you for listening, and I am ready for your questions. <laughs>